Good afternoon. My name is Doug Punger with the Winston-Salem Tourist Club and co-chair of the Centennial History Project. And with me today is John Tortiff. John, say hi. Uh, John, where's that? Okay. John, Hello, there. everyone. Yes. Good. <laughs> and we're with uh, our most senior Torch member, Ed Latimer, who's That's been that. a member of Torch since 1950. That's right. I think 96, I think I'm the oldest member now. They, they said that they couldn't find anybody the older. That is amazing, absolutely amazing. Our pleasure to be with him today and to talk with him today. Uh, why don't you tell us a little about where you were born and raised? My family, I was telling Doug that they migrated into Maryland in the 1600s and then gradually uh, stayed there over the generations. My one of the direct ancestor fought for the Maryland militia during the American Revolution. And then after the revolution, he died and, uh, and his widow, with five children, migrated to South Carolina under a land grant and settled, <clears throat> settled on the Savannah River in Abbeville County. Uh, there were three boys and two, girl, two girls. Uh, she remarried a fellow named Elgin, who was also from, from Maryland, and he was a, he was a lawyer, and, uh, and he uh, took off with a According to the records, he took off with a young gal and went to Tennessee and was never heard from again. <laughs> <laughs> so she was left as, I guess, was what's called as a, as a grass widow for the rest of her life. But uh, one of my branch stayed in South Carolina. Another boy, uh, descendants, stayed in South Carolina and gradually migrated to Georgia and on west. The one of the daughters that married, uh, they moved, our father in the revolution moved to, to Alabama and then moved west. Another, another married a Madison in the state of South Carolina, but generally, following that, my my ancestors migrated from Anderson, from Abbeville County over to Anderson County. That's in the to, Low Country, right? To up Country, down oh, the, the mountains. They moved to the Up all Country. They all up the Country. Okay. To Greenville County, and they settled there, and they, uh, and so it came down to me, <clears throat> but my father was. Was uh, uh was in the uh, coast artillery during World War One, was stationed in the in the Army Coast Artillery in New York City when the uh, when World War One broke out, and he was he went to France along with his coast artillery unit. that had large cannon we call it recoil cannons that were set up for defense, but they would load them on these ships, took them to Brest, France, loaded them on. Uh, on the boxcars and took them to the front line, and they were actually firing into Germany on coast artillery cannons. And they, anyway, he went, so he, he was in World War One. After the war, okay. he came back to New York City and was at Fort uh, Hamilton, uh, the two, yeah. four or five four forts. All right. And he b became an electrician while he was in, in, in service because he, oh, he went in at, at 17, came back, he was, he was still at about 20. And Westinghouse offered him a job if he would go up and join him at, at uh, Syracuse, New York. That, but he turned out and said, I'm going, still going back south. So he came back to South Carolina and uh, he got married. And my older brother was born in South Carolina. And this uh, in Greenville or in the coast? Green, Greenville, South Carolina. Greenville, South Carolina. Greenville, all up country. Okay. He, he became uh, the uh, electrician in charge of the, of the electrical generating plant for one of the mills in Pelzer, South Carolina, okay. which is in Anderson County. And then uh, at that time, he had an uncle that ran a, uh, uh, some type of uh, uh, furniture company or, or uh, some, uh, in, in Miami, Florida. Miami, at that time, Florida was just, Miami, Florida was just a settlement. <laughs> and he, he, he would float uh, mahogany logs from Central America across to to Miami wow. Wow. on this uh, lumber company set up. Okay. So my father ran his his electrical unit there, for, and I was born in Miami. That's really? where I was born Miami, Miami okay. Shores. And where'd you go to high school? So I, I, we stayed there two years. We moved back to South Carolina, and my younger sister was born back in South Carolina. So okay. my older brother was born in South Carolina. I was born in Florida, back to South Carolina, my sister. And then I, I went to public schools there in Greenville, Anderson, Pelzer, and then we moved to uh, the Columbia when he was a uh, with electrician with the okay. with the REA system during that time that uh, Roosevelt was setting it up. All right, so you and, chose to go to college at Charleston. Well, actually, at that time we were living in West Columbia, 
and then he got a job as an electronics at the Charleston Navy Yard. Oh. In 19, uh, 1940, that's 1938, okay. we moved to Charleston. So that's so I, to Charleston. So I was in grammar school and high school and uh, junior high and high school in Charleston. Okay. And, uh, and then when I turned 18 in uh, February of 45, and during the meantime, during the period of war, they were they always getting people speak on the coast. I was in the coast, uh, the state militia, in case anybody started invading South Carolina. I was a game warden, I'm not a game warden, <laughs> but a night watchman, and also uh, as part of the uh, Coast Guard, harbor of the Coast Guard before I even turned 18. <laughs> so when I turned 18, I went into the, uh, went into the Army infantry here at Fort Jackson in Columbia. Wow. And then from there I went to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina and the Airborne. And then uh, they, at that time, they stretched it back and forth day by day, if any way they wanted yeah. At that time, the Air Force was part of the Army. So they said, well, we really need somebody now in the Army Air Corps. Said, how about you want to stay here at Fort Bragg or you want to say, send, me, send, me to, send me to Texas to uh, Shepherd Field at uh, Wichita Falls, Texas, which is on the Oklahoma border. And I took uh, the, the cadet training there. And at that time, uh, at 45, uh, Europe started winding down. And then by the time I finished there in the fall of 45, the Japs had wind down and said, well, now we really don't need any more pilots. We're gonna, we're gonna stretch you over to, uh, to the army medics. I said, okay. So they stretched me then to California <laughs> and I went to Fort Beale, Beale Air Force Base in California, which is above Sacramento, and was there in the in the Army medics. And they had, at that time, following the war, when all the thousands of troops were coming out of the Pacific to the Pacific coast, they would come through the various uh, Army bases, one was Fort Ward, uh, Fort uh, Beale, and, and, and Fort Lewis in, in Washington, this, mm -hmm. that, and the other. We had that set of us, what's known as separation centers. But eventually, we, you had the College of Charleston. And we were, well, yeah. I, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd already done about two years at the College of Charleston before I turned okay. 18. Okay. And then, uh, so I was I was a medic there until I got out in 19 and, uh, and 47. And uh, I came back to Charleston and then graduated from the College of Charleston in 1948 okay. with a BS degree. At that time, I didn't know whether I wanted to become a physician or a lawyer, so I took I had an undergraduate degree in both in pre-med and pre-law. I had four years of biology, four years of chemistry, four years of chemistry, four years of of uh, this, that, and the other. And uh, at that time, it was kind of hard to get in med school, so yeah. I, I went to law. So I came up to University of South Carolina in nineteen in the fall of nineteen forty-eight, and and graduated there in 1951. But during that time, uh, in 1948 to 1950, the, the Columbia Torch Club had been organized in 1948. And I got to know a lot of the lawyers and the, and the uh, judges and the, this, that, and the other, uh, the Torch Club here, they asked me to come. So I, I became a, uh, just a visitor for two years, 1948 and 1949. While you were in law school? While I was in law school. And then in my senior year, I said, well, I'll just join. So I joined in my senior year in law school, and been a member ever since. Which is amazing, it's amazing. So I'm still here. You are. Uh, briefly, <laughs> so that's, you that's... had a very illustrious career as a lawyer, but I'll save more time talking about torts. Okay. But you served in a number of capacities for the state government. That's... I think the last position with the Fish and Wildlife Lawyer well, for the Fish. Right. And also, I was uh, then that got me uh, as a judge advocate for what's known as the South Carolina State Guard, okay. which is a state unit of the National Guard. That, when the okay. National Guard is, is nationalized, which they can do at will, the State Guard then comes over as, as in effect, the State National Guard. Right. So I was a Judge Advocate General for the State Guard until about 1970. Wow. So I was with them for about 40, 45 years. And I understand and then, you still have your license. I still have my law, uh, law license. I keep it up because uh, even though I, I, uh, I had a stroke about 10 years ago and I, I don't have too much use of the left side and... I don't have any balance. That's why I'm sitting here in, in this uh, battery-operated uh, wheelchair. I, I lost all balance. 
So, uh, but as a result, I, uh, even though I closed my office out about 10 years ago and got rid of all my law books and files and this, that, and other, as much as I could. I had thousands and thousands of books that I got rid of. But, uh, so, but even now, I get two or three calls a day from either former clients or somebody else that sees my name as a lawyer. And instead of me giving them advice or helping them out on a will or what have you, I keep my license up. Otherwise, they'd be practicing without a law, without a license. They might arrest me now. <laughs> well, tell us, tell us about the Torch Club in the 1950s. Uh, 1950, we had about, uh, we varied between uh, 30 and about 60. Went up and down, up and down over the years. And even now, it's, it's down to probably about, about 25 active members. We have been up to 60. And it uh, it depends on who brings who in and this, that, and the other. Now, I was telling uh, Doug that back then, the, the clubs were organized by professional uh, organizers. They would go into a, to a town, and the, and the Torch Club, would, Torch International, would make a contract with them that you could organize a club, and you could have, as your fee, you could have all of their dues for one year. And, and the, most of the clubs were organized under that status. And I think that's the only way we're ever going to increase our membership is, is to have these professional organizers because we've tried it by Torch members taking their time off, especially some up in, in Winchester and uh, Fredericksburg, whatever. We had some that, in effect, just took off and started organizing clubs, but after a while, they, they just beat out. They, they couldn't, couldn't stand it. So I don't think it's going to be a, a, an element of, of being able to do it by club by club. It's going to have to be done by some professional organizer. Yeah, where did you meet in the 50s? Uh, we've met over the years, same way there. We, we met that time uh, at one of the uh, local cafes. Okay. And then uh, we switched to uh, the officers club at Fort Jackson for a number of years. We went to uh, some of these uh, uh, other uh, private uh, country, club, clubs. country clubs, what have you. At Overs, or, that's one thing is, you have to find some good place to eat. And we finally met on this private club called the Palmetto Club, which is a resistance right behind the Supreme Court building here. And we meet there once a month every uh, fourth Tuesday. So well, we've come, over, over the years, we've, we've met probably a, a, a couple of dozen different places. Yeah. What offices have you held in your club? I've had every, every office in the, in the local club off and on for two or three or four or five times. <laughs> and then uh, during that time, uh, they had a hard time recruiting anybody to become a regional director. Yeah. And uh, they went on for a couple of times, and I'd go off and then come back. I, I was regional director four or five times also. Right. I tried to talk. Uh, we At that time, we had uh, clubs at, uh, here in Columbia, one in Greenville, one in, uh, in Asheville, one in Knoxville, one in Nashville, one in Athens, one in Jacksonville, Florida, one in Gainesville, Florida, and one in Boca Raton, Florida. And over the years, the only ones left are the ones in Athens and Columbia. They've gone up and down, up and down, phased out, and what have you. So all those other clubs have either gone out of the existence or what have you. But when you when you first became a director, who was the did you have an executive director of IETC, or was there a management no, company? No, there was a president. Under the original, you have to go back and check the original constitution and bylaws. Okay. The, at that time, the, the, the regional directors ran Torch. I see. We would elect the president. He would act in the, in the absence of the, of the Torch uh, mm -hmm. board meeting. Okay. And then everybody, everybody got along with everybody. Okay. So recently that we've had this problem of, of people kind of getting at each other's throats. Okay. We've never had any problems. Oh, we all got together, and I've known practically every one of the presidents from 1950 on. You come president? Yeah, I was I was president. Uh, I, I, during that time, of course, I, I was on the board, off the board, I'm back on the board. I helped set up the foundation along with uh, with uh, uh, Dick Lynch in New York and uh, and uh, two or three others. And, uh, yeah, Walter? Uh, yeah, Walter. Walter. He, yep. he, 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 was the, he was the one that really organized the foundation. That Torch is set up as, as a type of debating club. Mm -hmm. You debate a point, and then you, you take the other side and debate that point, good, bad, and back and forth. And if you, if you can't see the other side of a point, you really aren't learning anything. 
It's true. So they some of them got TO'd with 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 the, with the water, and they that's when they things got to hit the fan because for some reason or another, the uh, at the Torch magazine at the last minute they were going to censor this fellow's paper. Oh, you're uh, talking about the paper Mr. Mull wrote? Yeah, yeah, and and, and uh, sure enough, he said, well, they they called me and said. With this this particular paragraph, we we're not gonna print. We can either strike it, or you can agree to strike it and print it. Otherwise, we're not gonna print it. He said, "Well, it doesn't make it interesting. Just go and do it." So he was one that raised the business of censorship. I said, "Torch is not not set up for censorship. We're for freedom of speech, freedom of press, and no censorship. Talk about anything you want to. You don't have to agree to them or just disagree, what have you. But they." Uh, if the if the international itself is going to try to tell the local club what person they can or cannot become a member, the torch is going to destroy itself. Mm -hmm. So I think they finally realize that now. Yeah. So that that kind of brings you up to date on that. That's the only real controversy I've ever been involved with while I was on the board and also as well, president. Good. We have all the presidents and all the, we always got to go on with everybody. Well, who, well, like who the St. Catharines, that stuff. We just went and had a great time. We'd always take our wives and children and grandchildren and great grandchildren to, to all of the conventions. Well, we, well, with your seventy-year look back, okay, we're trying to identify in this century, this half century, who were some of the most memorable, outstanding leaders that you want to well, mention. Well, over, over the years, I've worked with Dick Lynch and all of in New York. We've had two or three conventions there, uh -huh. and I've known him just about doing from the nineteen fifties on, and. Uh, you know, Stephen Toy? Steve Toy is good. In fact, Steve, I, I, I rank as number, number one, along with Dick Lynch. Okay. Steve is excellent. He's still active. He is. Uh, yes. Even though he's, he's, uh, he's an independent now, because I believe his club in, in New York, it's not New York, it's New York, Delaware, <laughs> he moved over to Pennsylvania, and he's kind of a member at large now, I think. Okay. But he, some of my jokes that I send out over the time he says to me, and I relay them back, back by email. But uh, he's he's excellent. Uh, Let's talk about some of the changes that have occurred in Torrance over these last fifty years. Let's start with women. Uh, in nineteen seventy two or three, women were not allowed to be members of Torch. and then the way. ITC said they could join. Same way that that was left left up to the individual clubs. Right, right. And of course, even now you may have rules and regulations, but it's still going to be up to the local club. <clears throat> we had a, a head of the English department at the University of South Carolina. Who was an old Navy retired Navy captain that said, "No women in this organization." So uh -oh. until he died, we did not let any women. In. We let women come as guests, but they were not joined. But well, what was but the first since, women who joined? Uh, I can't remember now, but uh, probably the wives of some of the members. And, and how, we, how, now we have a husband and wife member also on our present uh, staff. Okay, so they're. So the same thing. The same thing with the, we we did we did not have any uh, uh, disagreement with uh, with blacks. So uh, 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 we had one black member for a couple of years, and he was very nice. But he decided that wasn't for him, so he quit. So we don't have any rules against uh, either for or against okay. anything like that. Do you have any black members now? Don't have any black members now. We have okay. guests okay. occasionally, but okay. uh, we okay. we offer them a chance to join if they want to. But yeah. we don't. Uh, we leave it up to them. Okay. Um, and that's another thing. The the torch the way it's set up is still set up really. The torch is a is a is an informal organization of independent federated clubs. Right. You talk about you talk about anybody forcing something on Winston Salem or Columbia, clubs will just forget about it. Say forget I'll just leave and forget about it. So it, it, the clubs are independent. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not a national organization. It's a confederation. Let's see. Uh, you talked about your membership and it's maintained pretty well. How have changes and advances in technology, email, Zoom, so forth, affected your club's uh, now experience? That's, that's forming down. Now, when I, I was with the with the Attorney General's office from, from say, 1959 until I retired in the 1980s. During that time, of course, we were still in the typewriting, manual typewriter stage. Went to electric typewriter. And then went to what's the one where you can and a memory typewriter. Memory typewriter, right. and then by the, when I retired in the early eighties, the the uh, the uh, uh, computer was just being organized. The computer didn't get started until 
the late sixties, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and then the nineteen the or seventies, yeah. really seventies. Yeah. And then uh, from from nineteen, from the time I retired, when everything started going digital, uh, it's changed because that time in the local torch club, all of our expenses were on mailing notices, hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Well, now I got all the members by. Uh, let me see. Email. Uh, yeah, that's that's about. Yeah. It, now I can have all of them on the, on the, on the email. I can I can put the message out and punch and send everything to 35 or 40 members instantaneous free. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's a big, big advantage. Now that's about the extent of my digital knowledge is <laughs> setting up emails anyway. <laughs> you were the president that was um, uh, when the Torch website was activated. I, one of your presidential messages mentions this new uh, technology, new technology that, that, that right. Torch was getting into. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. And it's still still going because at that time, of course, the most of the cost of the international involves the the payment of the of the uh, staff, I guess you call it. Yeah. Which uh, at, at one time back, one time it was run by non-paid members. And then we then we hired an organization in Chicago, and association then, builders. Yeah, and then the first thing you know that. They started going up on the fees, and we fired them while I was on the board. And then we went with the with a group of uh, ones and members of the club in, in Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, the Strickland's. Strickland's. And Strickland's wife uh, was retired and didn't have anything to do, so we said, "Okay, we'll we'll hire you for a few thousand dollars a year just to kind of keep our paperwork up." And that that was the smoothest operation we've ever had was with the Strickland's. And then finally, got to the point where they said it was too much. They were getting ready to retire anyway. Yeah. So then we switched over to one or two other companies, and we've had difficulties with with companies. Remember Jim the, Coppinger? Coppinger went out out west. He had it for a while, and then they went with the IMG. Yeah, and then then also with the one now in, in Ohio. Right. But uh, that's that's a big problem now, on on how much who you're gonna get and how much you go pay them and how much they're supposed to do because really what is there to do on the international except keep track of the clubs and the only expense really is the publication of the magazine now even when I was president I said with the technologies coming along sooner or later printed editions are going to pretty well go out of existence it's too expensive put everything digital and when a club presents a paper they can digitize it Send it to a central location, say at the present time at at uh, in Ohio, mm -hmm. and put it on record, and then have it available for all of the torch members to tune into it. And I think that's that's going to be the real change from mm -hmm. now on. Well, I'm talking about the torch magazine, how has it changed over the years? Uh, it's 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 about, right along about the same. I I've known the the editors. In fact, the editor was a member of the Norfolk Club for years and years. And we were a retired CPA. In Stanfield's? Uh, no, was before Stanfield. A uh, Reed Taylor? Before Reed Taylor. Before Reed Taylor. Oh, gosh. <laughs> anyway, he did a good job. And all, all the editors have done a real job. But the thing is, is, that's time consuming also. And the cost of printing the magazine is going out now. Everything's going digital. Yeah. Sooner or later, we've got to have everything digital. Yeah, I think so. And that, that will eliminate 99% of our problems, I think. Right there, when we get because up until a few years ago, every member had access either through the telephone or the home phone or, or the home address or office address where they could get in touch. Now it's it's hard to, to get this information out of the international. That was right now. If I want to say, send me a copy of, of all the emails of. Of, the, of every club in the country and say, well, we might be able to do it or might not. Well, certainly they can do it because they've got it set up that way, but they don't want to do it. Mm. Why? I don't know. Mm. It's, it's a type of, some type, it's a type of secrecy. Mm. I'm against secrecy. I'm against censorship and secrecy. Okay. And then a few years ago, one of our members uh, won the Paxton Award for, for artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, now, same way over there, Paxton 
we met uh, one of the, our conventions and offered him. Paxton was still living, and I got to know him real real well. I, I stayed with him for a week or so. He was he was head of the Associated Press for the state of New York for a number of years, member of the Albany Torch Club, and set up the the money to set up the the Paxton Award. And he took me on a personal tour of the Rockefeller Center wow. uh, uh, offices there in Albany. So I, so I, I really remember Paxton, Paxton real well. He was, he was a fine fellow. In 2012, yeah. Portsmouth, you were the president. At Portsmouth, Which... we had a good convention there. In fact, we had a hurricane that came through, or almost a hurricane, on the night we were getting ready to board the ship to, to the know, harbor. And sure know, enough, we, we had a terrible time going through the rain. But it was, it was good. We had a good convention there. Then in 2013, you brought everybody to Columbia, South Carolina. We had, of course, the same one here. We toured, gave them a tour of the Columbia area. And uh, same thing, we, we enjoyed it. We had, had a good good time with everybody. Super, super. Um, tell us about your experience on the foundation board. You've been on the Same thing there. The Walter, Walter uh, Dick Lynch and I, and two or three others over a period of time, organized that and just started off and people that first thing was that some fellow in Chicago uh, that we never know he never was a member of Torch Club and nobody ever knew him set some money aside for for Torch Foundation and that's that's where we got it underway really how much money uh, it was up in the thousands of dollars we it's still set up where it has to be set up separately from the rest of the funds huh so over the years we've, we've added to it so in, but you don't know who it was. Is, How's is that? this Bob, uh, Robert Oldenburg? Olden, Oldenburg. Oldenburg Foundation, that's right. That's that's a yeah. part of, separate part of it. The, the, the Torch Foundation is the only part of Torch that has tax exemption. Torch International is not a tax-exempt organization. Right, right. It's merely a tax, tax-free. tax You can't you take deduct taxes going to the Torch itself. You have to take it to the Foundation. And then we, in turn, give specifically for educational purposes, whatever, to back to the Torch International itself. Okay. Who are so, some of the major contributors? What most of the money? Uh, we have uh, lifetime members and the ones that give every year. And okay. Anne Sterling is one of the big ones. She's, she's been a big member and okay. supporting of it. All, all of the, all of the clubs have done it over the years. Okay. Now we don't. We last in the last few years have been some some idea that we might just start shuffling off this money to the to the uh, international but if we do we go get in touch we go get in, involved with the IRS on 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 our business of being a tax free organization because we can only do it for educational purposes right. and and the enhancement of the associated itself right. so we have to be very careful on how we we, we give the money to say for the publication of the magazine Okay. Things like that, but we start just throwing money off there for, for scholarships, whatever. We're gonna be in trouble. I think you well deserved the title of emeritus director at large, 2014. Tell us how that came about. Well, same way that I was, uh, I'd been off and on the the board for a number of times, and I was reelected as the regional director for this region four, and uh, we were trying to bring in. Because the other clubs just didn't want to participate. They didn't want to nominate anybody. So I, I stayed on. And, uh, and Ann Sterling got in touch with uh, with somebody in, in Atlanta. Who was he? was a retired uh, retired pharmacist. And said, I've talked to him into being the regional director if you resign. I said, if you resign, we'll make you... Emeritus, okay, it's okay with me. <laughs> so that's how I became an emeritus, emeritus. <laughs> uh, do you still serve or have you retired now? Uh, I don't know why I'm still on there or not. I haven't been paying attention that much. <laughs> We're not talking about another thing when things start getting out of hand. When they when they met in, in Texas, I didn't go down there. San Antonio. Yeah, there was a the lawyer in Texas. I never met him. I've corresponded. He and a few others, and I, just, I, 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 I'm not going to name any name. Anyway, the controversy then came up about Walter, uh -huh. and uh, and then it came up and said, "Well, we're going we are we're going to reorganize our constitution and bylaws." I said, "Well, I said it's, it's worked pretty good since 1948 for us, 
I don't think a thing really needs too much reorganization, but I don't have any objection to it as such. But they in turn use that to uh, to really put people on and kick people off that they didn't want. So I don't know whether I got kicked off at that point or not. I haven't seen my name in the magazine, so maybe I've been kicked off. <laughs> and that doesn't bother me either. <laughs> 2017 was another pivotal year where um, Fred Mull was supposed to become president. Apparently he got sick. Uh, and then Dick Lynch or Dick Fink being president? Yeah, it said during that time, the only other time that that happened was was when I was on the board and the the, the president-elect was from Portsmouth, Virginia, and we met and he had a heart attack the next day. Oh, oh my word. He recovered, but he resigned as president and Reed Taylor came back on he was a past president. He came right. back on for another two. That's the only time I know of that okay. we've had two terms of yeah. presidents as yeah. such. Yeah. Actually, we've never had very much success in, in big cities. We had a club in East D.C. and it folded. We had Atlanta and it folded. All of the big cities don't really... So it's usually the suburbs. Same way in Chicago, it was actually in Dearborn where we had the convention. And uh, so it was a good convention, but... We, we never really had uh, been able to succeed in, in having uh, in large cities in New York right. and whatever. In that light, I'm going to ask you a few questions based upon your 70 years experience to shed light on things. So in that 70 year window, what have been the most significant changes in the organization in 70 years? Uh, I think it's the present time where they, they're completely reorganizing the, or rewriting the constitution and bylaws Mm -hmm. where I think they should go back to the original ones and take it from there. Okay. Are there any elements of the torch experience that have been a constant in a positive way over 70 years? Uh, I think you'd have to, you'd have, to have a, a, a mindset where you, you like to be with people, discuss issues, discuss volatile issues, but not get mad. As the old, old saying is that you discuss something and you leave as friends. Right. And we've always been able to do that in Columbia, even though over the period of time we've had, at uh, one time we had a controversy, we had a physician who was pro-Arab during the original Arab oil controversy, mm -hmm. and we had a rabbi oh, who, right. of course, was on the opposite side, and even though they took opposite positions, they, they still became state friends. And that, that, that's torch in my estimation. Right. Um what, in your opinion, distinguishes Torch, makes it different from a Rotary Club, a Kiwanis Club, a Sertoma Club? Why would Kristen want to join Torch instead of some other kind of club? Same way. The social organization, I've been a member and president of the Lions and the Rotary and the, this, that, and the other. Those have specific goals. All right. Torch meets entirely for discussion. We don't espouse anything. We don't, we don't do anything. We don't we don't have money. We don't support don't money for money. anything. Right. We are completely independent just for discussion for intellectual purposes. Now, That's in your club, thing. do the members give talks or do you have guest speakers? We sometimes? have both. Both the, most of them are members, but we have some guest okay. talks. We don't have any separate okay. one with the other. All right. In fact, a lot of times we we'll invite the, the president, a person to come in and speak and offer him the, the right to join us if we yeah. want to. So we yeah. picked up some members like That's that. That's true. We've done that too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, over the years. Could I throw a question go, at this point? Go ahead. Doug? Yeah, go ahead. I, uh, I just thought that um, with all your years of experience, uh, uh, any comments on um, on outstanding uh, women leaders that, uh, like I'm thinking of Ann Sterling and Noreen Haas and, and um, like, to uh, green hold yeah. has has there been others that are that have been uh, those those major are those are the three big ones we've had others that that uh, maybe the wives they would participate because when we would hold uh, we've always taken the position during that time that that the board was open to every every member of the torch club now they they're kind of restricting that to a certain extent now they're saying well you can you can sit in but you can't 
you can't say anything unless we tell you you can say something. I've always taken a position it was open. And up until that, I was to sit in on the meetings. If we, if we got into a delicate situation where we were voting on money or something like that, we'd go into executive session. But when we came back, we would open it up and tell what we did. So that's that's the only change now that, that we may be we may be getting away from the business of, of really this this is an organization where every Torch member should have access to everything that's going on within Torch International. And when with digital setup, we should be able to not necessarily zoom in because it's, it's, we we have we have a hard time getting the zoom even here. I, I sit in on our meetings by zoom, but it's hard to set up a zoom from club by club. So we really need to go to the point of of somebody joining in if, they, if they're in, in the vicinity, they can join with the club or they can join in by Zoom or they can, the clubs could submit their their talks either by uh, digitally or video or whatever <clears throat> for the international as a, as a kind of a bank and then people pulling out at will to look and read. That's going to be our future, I believe. Mm. Well, on that light, we're getting to the end of this interview. Do you have any general observations, constructive advice, or any inspirational comments you want to share with the other members of Torch as we close out this interview? And I think it's just a matter of, of mainly meeting and, and, and uh, having friendly discussions, pro and con, and then not getting, it might be, might be controversial and everything, and you can get at each other's throats, but leave as friends. If you don't do that, you're in trouble. Well, thank you very much, Ed, for this interview. Uh